Hello, everyone, and welcome to the next Up Level Live session. Um, we're so excited to have you here. Um, and so let's just go through a couple of things like we always do at the beginning. So if this is your first time here, welcome. Um, I am Robin Cohen. I'm the co-founder of Up Level. We are a micro-learning online experience, and we tend to focus in the areas of career or entrepreneur mentorship. And so um, we have a live session every Wednesday, um, but that becomes um, recorded and it becomes content on our site. So you can access it at any time when it's convenient for you. Um, when you join us right now, you, if you're new to Crowdcast, um, to the right, you'll see all the, the chat area. So what I always tell people is don't be shy. Tell us where you're tuning in from. I'm from Salt Lake City. Um, I have Angie here. She's tuning in from, is it Denver, right, Angie? Aspen, Colorado. Hey, okay, Aspen. Colorado. I was close, but I knew that you're you know, located in Colorado. So please, don't be shy. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Um, we love to know where everyone is coming in from. So Kate is tuning in from Chicago. That is awesome. Um, so yes, please tell us where you are tuning in from. Um, and remember, today's topic is how to effectively communicate virtually. And so um, as Angie goes through this, um, you'll see at the bottom of your screen, ask a question. So what we wanna do is we wanna separate um, the chit chat, you know, people like where you're tuning in from, from actually being able to separate your questions specifically for our Q and A session at the end. And what's also great about the ask a question section is people can upvote your question so that we're sourcing the best questions um, for Angie to answer at the end of her session. So again, chat is to your right, ask a question uh, is below. And so let me introduce our speaker today. So Angie is the founder and principal of Career Benders. Angie helps inspire confident professionals through career coaching, job search guidance, resume writing, and professional development services. As a former engineer, Angie specializes in working with technical professionals, high-level managers, and executives to navigate the challenges of the workforce today. In just two years, Career Benders has helped nearly 400 individuals across the country realize their true potential and marketability, find career satisfaction, and grow with confidence. As a natural and engaging speaker, Angie's excited to impart some of this wisdom to the up-level audience as we all work to inspire confident professionals. Well, welcome, Angie. Thank We're super you. excited to have you here. Hopefully, um, I will live up to all that. Very welcome. <laughs> of course. Um, and so for some of you out there, you will probably be familiar with Angie from the Get Hired Summit. Um, and so I was a part of the first one, and I know that she participated in the second one. So I'm sure some of you are going to be familiar with her from, from that. Um, and Angie, just to kind of kick things off to, um, you know, get a little bit more into you and career benders. Just want to ask you a couple questions before I give the floor over to you. So tell us, when did you start Career Benders and like what was the impetus for it? Sure, I started, so we're coming up on three years, so January will be our third anniversary. Congrats. We have now crossed the threshold past 400 um, clients, probably just since I gave you that number a few weeks ago. Um, and, and really, it's a, there's a little bit of a backstory to get to the impetus of, of how this business came to fruition. But um, really, it, it's I have always had an interest in kind of helping people be better versions of themselves. And I've always had and it took it kind of took 20 years to put a name to it an entrepreneurial spirit, tons of side hustles over the years. And just they all kind of had a common theme. Um, and so after starting my career as an engineer, I moved into nonprofit management and was an executive director for a few years. And that really kind of set the stage for moving into some sort of business of my own. And I knew I wanted it to be some sort of coaching because I felt like I had the capacity for that. And I came across the career specialty, which 
three years ago was kind of in its infancy and just be kind of just kind of on the rise um, just as the whole online career landscape has shifted. And so um, it really just kind of smacked me in the face. And I was like, that's it, because I think that's what I struggled with in the past of like the side hustles is what's the focus. And yeah. for me, having worked in so many different um, industries and going through career change myself really felt like I had a perspective here and I kind of put that authentic opinion out there and it really stuck and has grown some legs and been a, you know a steaming freight train for the last two years and almost nine months so it's been right. pretty awesome. That's awesome good for you. Um, my next question for you is what has been the most rewarding part of running your own business? I, want, I really want to answer that with what's been the most rewarding part about coaching people in careers, but okay. um, I'll answer your question first and then I'll, and then I'll, I'll add that part in because it's just very okay. significant. I've always kind of been wired for this. And for me, the creativity behind how to um, grow a business, brand a business and offer, offer and package services that are compelling yeah. and helpful to people is, is really rewarding to me. I mean, I have, consistently seen from year one to year two, two X growth, from year two to year three, two X growth. And so it's just, it's pretty amazing to, to, to think, oh my gosh, I can do this. And it actually then, you know, shows up. And yeah. as far as actually coaching people in the career space, I didn't expect it at first, but one of the things that has really been a common theme throughout everybody I've worked with, whether it's a new grad trying to find their place in the professional world or, you know, a more seasoned executive trying to figure out what they want the, their, you know, their last years of their career to look like. The ability to instill confidence and help people find that confidence has been the most rewarding part of how I get, provide my services. And right. that's really what inspired the tagline, Inspiring Confident Professionals. So right. when we rebranded last fall, that really made sense because it, it is a common theme and it's one of the most gratifying things that unexpectedly has come out of, of the work. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, my final question is what is your best, uh, best advice for people job searching right now? Uh, keep it. You've got to have, and we're going to talk about some of this in the presentation yep. too, even, so we'll even be able to go tactical in this, but my best advice in the snapshot right now is networking is where it's at. The number of people I have who are getting into processes or creating opportunities for themselves through networking is off the charts than it usually is. And statistically speaking, the hidden job market has always been the larger place people hire. So even though yeah. online job boards have come into so much focus and tracking systems and all that stuff, and as candidates, we can often, often lean very heavily on that, 70% of positions are not filled there. Um, right. And I think that 70% is even growing right now, probably because from a hiring perspective, it's easier to spend a month longer networking, getting internal referrals for candidates than trying to sift through a stack of a thousand of them. Right. Um, and so I have always been a big proponent of the multi-pronged approach and the comprehensive approach to job searching. And I think it's even more significant now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what I want to tell everyone is um, before I hand over the floor to, to Angie is, again, ask a question, just click it at the bottom of your screen so that we can really separate out your questions from the chat. Again, everyone that's here, please let us know where you're tuning in from. It's kind of exciting to see people tuning in from across the country. I've even had people tune in from Canada, so that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, and you know what? Even uh, throw in the chat, you know, like um, not necessarily questions, but, you know, what What even maybe like topics could we cover mm -hmm. um, during the Q&A um, as Angie goes through her presentation? Um, so that can also help direct the, the Q&A so that that it's most beneficial for you. And remember at the very, very, very end, out even after Q&A, we're going to be announcing the winner of our giveaway. So in case you don't know, Angie is giving away a group coaching session for free. And I think that this is great because I'm like, well, what's better than one-on-one -on -one coaching? Group coaching. <laughs> And, you know, I think it'll be great because if you happen to know a couple of people that, you know, like, hey, let's say you want to update your resume, 
let's say that you want to have, you know, a better understanding of how to position yourself in a cover letter. Um, let's say you have a couple of friends, even colleagues, maybe you're looking for a job right now. And, you know, rather than having the coaching session just for you, you can have a group of friends. And I think it's like for a maximum of four people, right, Angie? So I'll clarify. So okay. it's, a, it's a package of group coaching sessions, one seat at each of four different types of, co of sessions. So just to give you a little bit, because this is, I'm excited about this. So this is a yeah. new, this is a new program that we're rolling out this fall. And so the giveaway is actually not only the ability to go through the whole program, but you're actually going to be part of the beta group. So you're going to be part of giving me feedback to help kind of fine tune the coaching for future. And so you'll have a seat at um, one of each of four group sessions with a maximum of 12 people in it. Um, there's a resume session, there's an optimizing LinkedIn session, there's a um, virtual communications session. So it'll be a little bit like this, but probably on a more granular level. And then I'm spacing on the fourth one right now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically what I've done is taken our job search strategy process, which is a really popular um, service and kind of give it, compartmentalized it in, in, in a way that it's approachable to be able to do it in a group setting. So. Yeah. Yep, I love it, and that's awesome. So again, after her presentation, after the Q&A, we will announce the winner. Awesome. So I'm, I'm gonna hand over the floor to you. I am going to um, you know, take off my video so you have the full floor to yourself. Um, so feel free to share your screen and get into your presentation. Will and do. I will remove myself, it's all um. you. And I'm learning, I'm learning how to use Crowdcast because I am, um, I lived on Zoom before everyone else moved in. So um, bear with me if I start to kind of screw things up. But um, so just to kind of revisit what Robin and I started with, I'm Angie. I founded Career Benders three years ago, and our mission is to inspire confident professionals. And one of the ways we do that is to partner with awesome people like Robin who are trying to do the same thing. And so I am always excited to get up and talk to, even if it's a virtual group who I can't see, um, people of, about um, growing yourselves personally and professionally and in your careers. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about today is how to refine and fine tune your virtual communications and some online networking um, so that you can just feel really confident in using this technology that has basically like flooded our entire lives. So just to go a little bit further and give you some more context about me, um, like we talked about, I founded Career Benders three years ago, and we provide comprehensive career coaching, resume writing, job search strategy services, and professional development, and even a little bit of recruiting to professionals all over the country of all levels and of all kinds of industries. I have a little bit of a specialty around technology, um, simply because I started my career as, as an engineer. I was a civil engineer, so not um, in the whole like software space, but um, there was kind of a natural gravitation towards people um, in that in that area since they felt like I could at least kind of understand their techie jargon and their engineering personalities. Um, and I um, so I started my career as a civil engineer and I practiced for about eight years before deciding to depart the industry in the middle of the Great Recession. So if there's somebody who can tell you about whether or not right now is a good time to change jobs or not, I've got infinite wisdom there <laughs> um, and can tell you that one of the reasons that I love career coaching is that I help people take that leap with a little bit more intention and a little bit more of a plan than I probably did, if I'm really, really honest. Um, and so uh, after, after I left engineering, I kind of fuddled around for a year and fully unexpectedly landed in the nonprofit sector um, where I was for about seven and a half years, four plus of which I was an executive director. And that's really where the entrepreneurial spark in me came alive, started to make sense. And like I said, I knew I wanted to kind of go into a business of my own and took the inspiration from that kind of always wanting to help people improve their stations in life and added it to career coaching. And I haven't looked back. It's been pretty amazing. And so what we're going to talk about today are some of my um, observations and insights into now that we're in a little bit of a paradigm shift as far as like, you know, socialization and communications go, how do we deal with this, this virtual world that is now everywhere and it's come flooding into our lives um, years before it really was expected to be as impactful on the level that it is today. And so 
you all are now joining my world <laughs> of the all, all, all consuming world of Zoom. And um, the thing about it is now it's everywhere. It's in our personal lives. It's in our professional lives and it can make or break your job search. And we're gonna actually talk about some little tips and insights into each of these three areas to help you not only manage the presence of uh, the virtual tools in our lives, but also make sure that you're actually leveraging them as well as you can and making sure they're not a hindrance to you as you communicate personally, professionally, and in a job search. So first let's talk about our personal lives. Now that things have shifted around a little bit, maybe we aren't so isolated. However, you know, after even six months of this, oh my gosh, my whole life lives on Zoom thing, it can definitely feel like it's the new norm. <laughs> um, I remember uh, the first time I went somewhere in the last like month or so that had more than 20 people, I was like, and I'm a super extrovert, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is kind of weird. So um, I think one thing is just mentally not to succumb to the isolation. And then I think that there's things that you can do beyond that to make sure that um, as to the extent you, you are making sure you're not isolated, bringing the technology in uh, where it makes sense because the fatigue is real. Um, you know, I, I'm used to this. I spend about 10 hours a day in client meetings on Zoom. It's still really tiring for me. And I can tell you after amping up my energy 20% to do this talk, I will be tired. Um, and so the fatigue is real, both from a short term and a long term perspective. And so um, I think that there are things that we really need to be cognizant about to make sure that we can manage the fatigue um, and not go overboard with the amount of technology that we're sitting in front of um, or that we're consuming. And one of the ways is pretty obvious, but get outside. And, um, you know, I'm very lucky to live in the mountains of Colorado. We do all of the things. We paddleboard, we uh, fly fish, <laughs> um, and just generally spend a lot of time enjoying nature. And it's been a really good release for us. And so whether you're in kind of a concrete jungle or whether you have the ability to kind of escape, get outside and give your eyes a break from the technology. Um, especially if you're someone who is now sitting on Zoom, you know, teachers are the ones who are like, Angie, I'm not, I'm totally not used to this. Um, and they're not used to being in front of computers. Don't go from the computer to your phone. Because ultimately, if you sit and think about it, you could be staring at a screen for like 16 hours a day nonstop. Um, so I think that you have to have a lot of awareness to make sure that you're managing that fatigue and not letting uh, the, the, the virtual tools completely consume all aspects of it. As far as how to leverage this stuff in our personal lives, you know, I think one of the, and Robin and I were talking about this, like finding like-minded groups. And I think that this comes into actually even your professional life as well when we talk about networking. But, you know, I love meetup.com. It's a great place to find professional networking and then people that like to hike and all those kinds of things. So this is actually a cool time to explore a new hobby and get yourself into some new virtual um, virtual communications settings where you have the ability to watch and listen and import, very importantly, interact so that you're not just sitting there staring, but actually talking to humans through these platforms. And like in these like-minded groups, whether they're personal or professional, are a great way to be able to do that because then in, in, this, in, in the way you're able to, you can take those connections offline um, and actually you know, get outside with people or have coffee with one or two people. Um, and it almost becomes a little bit of a boost to the professional life we had before. Um, and you can leverage the ability to communicate with people like all over the place and the fact that everyone is doing that now in a little bit of a better way. Um, and then, you know, personally, just get creative. So I'm gonna share like a little tiny geeky, geeky fact about me. Even before the whole work from home thing happened and before Zoom flooded our lives, my family and I play, have played Trivial Pursuit via Zoom together for like three or four years. And so this is a cool way to like be alone together, but you're not actually like only on the technology. There's something else in front of you. So get creative as far as like family game nights or, you know, reading a book is a great way to give your eyes a break. Um, and so, you know, almost like go back. What did they do before computers? Bring that stuff into your life a little bit. Um, and, and all of this will help you kind of be aware of the presence of technology in your personal life, leverage it and use it to the extent 
you need and want to, but not let it be so consuming that it's the only thing in front of you. Um, and then we get into kind of our professional lives because now our teams are online, our, you know, our, our workspaces are virtual and there is um, more and more evidence coming down the pipe that this is going to be long term. So big companies like Google and Twitter have announced that like into 2021, they're going to have fully remote workforces. And I wouldn't be surprised if that gets turned into permanent and lengthened as employers find out that we're actually more productive at home um, and the cost. And so this is, I think that like when we talk about paradigm shift, this has propelled us four, five, six, maybe even 10 years forward in the kind of like fully remote workforces. And so it's very important to make sure that you keep up your level of professionalism and don't make yourself look like a jerk with just some easy little tips. First of which is virtual communications is more than just this video. So um, now that you don't have the ability to walk next door to a cubicle necessarily, necessarily and ask your colleague a question, or you're not having those coffee, coffee cup or water cooler conversations, you have to think about all the ways you're communicating with people. For instance, emails and written communications are fully part of this virtual communications landscape that we have now. And they always have been, I just don't know that we were as aware as how critical they are to that kind of like full personal brand of yours that you're looking at and the messages that you're sending. Um, and so I think being concise and direct, and that's my communication style anyway, so maybe I'm biased, but you know, concise, direct, clear communications, especially via email have become even more important. I know when I get like an email this long, it seems like a whole lot to digest. Um, and so kind of thinking about how you can be part of the team and leverage virtual communications to make sure that um, things are working as smoothly and still a well-oiled machine. You have a play to, you have a part to play in that. Um, even down to um, spending happy, like if you were part of a team who used to go to happy hour or who used to chitter chatter in the kitchen, have some time to spend with each other to that effect. Um, my little sister-in-law lives in New York City and she and her team would do um, happy hours like once a week together and just sit and chat. And that's that kind of like personal professional line you can kind of come and go with a like-minded group that gives you ability to be social um and the other you know the other thing that i've been talking a lot of, with, uh, with people about is introverts versus extroverts and i think being aware of which one you are and what other people are is important here to that kind of team team building aspect of leveraging virtually virtual communications really well because if you're if you're an introvert and you're on a call with somebody like me who does not shut up you're gonna have a hard time having your voice heard. So it's important for me to be aware of that and bring those people into the conversation. But it's also, introverts have the idea that it's really easy for us type A's to just be on these and you know, I'm like, woohoo, and I'm standing and I'm just like having fun. But it's it's A, tiring and B, I miss, I miss real humans. <laughs> um, because this, while communicating with people virtually all day long does fill my desire to communicate, it does not fulfill my need to be around human people entirely. So I think having respect for kind of which side of the, the, the fence you fall there and respecting the other people that you're working with and their personalities um, is also, is also uh, really important to building that kind of like whole team thing. Um, and you know, the biggest area, and this is what I talk about the most, is how to either leverage or make sure the technology that has now come into your job search on a, in a bigger way is not a hindrance. And I fully believe that it falls one way or the other. You can either leverage technology as a help or it can become a hindrance because now technology has come into, for instance, an interview process and you've got yet another barrier to make sure that you are coming across the way you want to in an interview that didn't exist before. And so we also have a flooded workforce. So how do you stand out amongst the crowd? First, from a virtual perspective, I think you have to set yourself up for success. And what I mean here is visually. So um, make sure you have a good high quality camera. You're in a quiet space. I was sitting in on an interview last week um, for a, a position I'm recruiting for and the, the candidate's dogs started barking halfway through the interview. And I was just like, 
face palm. So, you know, set your, do, don't let stuff be in your environment that wouldn't be in your environment in an in interview or professional meeting. So, um, you know, nice quality camera, set yourself up with a professional looking background. I've had some clients who will like create little vignettes for themselves so that it like looks really good. Front facing light is important so that you're not shadowed. So set yourself up for success visually to have a professional virtual appearance. That's a really, really great starting point. Um, second, LinkedIn has is a tool that people have long overlooked. And I think that it is now relevant in a really, really, really big way. As people, I, I actually think networking is a little bit easier now than it used to be because you could go to an in-person networking event, but you kind of it was kind of a crapshoot on who was there. Whereas now you can be really intentional about networking with the exact people or companies you want to using something like LinkedIn. Um, this is an area where you your maybe LinkedIn isn't a hinder, hindrance, but it's a free asset sitting out there that you're not using to your advantage. Um, especially right now when people are just like, I think it was, I haven't looked at this statistic in a few months, but like in March, user sessions went up like 16% on LinkedIn. And I think like 15 million new people registered. <laughs> so like, it's the, like literally the world is your oyster on that platform. And so I encourage you to really leverage it instead of just being the passive profile that the majority of people are there that will really help you stand out from the crowd and can help you begin to have those conversations that could lead to somewhere in that 70% of the hidden job market, not filled on job board world. Um, and as you have these conversations, so, you know, ultimately the goal of connecting on LinkedIn is informational interviews and having conversations. So you really need to think about your interactions and your energy. So I always stand up when I'm doing these kinds of presentations. When I'm with clients, I don't, but I feel like I am much more on a stage and able to project and I have more energy and I'm a little bit like performing so that you guys can actually like feel the energy and stay engaged instead of just hearing like wah, 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 wah for 20 minutes. And so you'll have to think about kind of your energy and, and how you project on camera. A great way to do that is recording yourself. So you can see how you look, see how you interact hear yourself, <laughs> which most people hate, but it's really, really going to help so that you can fine tune your interactions and bring the energy you need to, to convey what you want to convey, especially in an interview setting. What I am finding, especially after sitting in on some of these interviews where I wasn't either the interviewer or the interviewee is that there's, there is a, the, the technology creates a disconnect um, where like the hiring managers don't quite feel the normal energy or connection they would if you were sitting in a room with them and were really able to physically engage. So you've got to turn it up 20% to make that come across the camera. And that's where like you're knowing how you interact and knowing how to bring energy becomes critical to making sure that technology is not getting in the way of a process that you would otherwise be successful in. And my biggest, biggest tip for how to do that effectively is to work it baby and channel your inner Ron Burgundy. So some of you, if you were at the Get Hired Summit, you've heard me say this like a million times, but I, I tell people my number, number one tip for how to communicate effectively via virtual video communications is to know how to work the camera and to go anchorman style on it. So as I talk to you right now, I'm moving my head around, but I am like boring my eyes into the center of the camera because it makes you feel as if I'm making eye contact with you. Whereas most of us have the tendency to want to look either at ourselves or at the other person on the screen. And I have big eyeballs. So this is a really easy <laughs> example for me to give. But as I'm looking at Ron Burgundy on my screen, I'm looking at his eyes, which makes me feel like I'm making eye contact. But to you, it looks like my eyes are half closed or that I'm looking down. And as soon as I come up and make eye contact with the camera, all of a sudden it's like, oh, and she's making eye contact with me. And that can make or break the ability to feel like you are actually making the connection virtually and kind of mimicking that eye contact that we know is critical to interview the interviewing process. Um, so that's like one really, really specific tip to kind of make sure you have that interaction that you need to virtually and that you bring good energy. Um, and so at this point, I think I'm going to stop talking for five seconds, take a sip of water, and I would love for um, Robin to come in and see 
I'm like I said, I'm new to the platform, so I'm not quite sure how to see questions, but um, would love to, you know, queue up some some Q and A here. And and I have I'm known for having opinions and advice about everything. So this is kind of no holds bar, whether it's about virtual communications, whether it's about job searching in general, whether it's about um, interviews, you know, whatever advice or insight I can give you guys, I'm happy to answer. And so um, I'm just going to spend the rest of the time doing exactly that. So I'm actually going to stop my screen share so that I can see the um, the meeting. Did I stop it, Robin? Yeah. Oh, OK, there, I did it. Hey. <laughs> Okay, so that was awesome. And I and I like the fact that you had it in a couple of different buckets, right? One bucket was, well, how does virtual communications look like right now in terms of our personal lives and how can you um, really separate yourself a little bit, right? Because we're now being mm -hmm. bombarded, you know, from a virtual standpoint, if you have Zoom meetings all day long, or even if you're just trying to like, you know, connect with people, recruit, you know, whatever that looks like, right? So I like the fact that, you know, part of how to effectively communicate virtually is to also take some time for yourself and yes. to like, get away from the computer and get away from your phone and so i like that i like the fact that it was like well how does this look professionally you know from like a professional standpoint um and then of course in terms of like your job search um so i think that it was great because i think that there's going to be some people that are specifically looking for a job right so it's like how do you navigate that virtually but then there are other people that they have a job, you know, and that they are on the yeah. Zoom call, you know, all day long. And so it's like, how do you, do you deal with that? And so um, I'm going to jump into a couple of questions that we have here. So um, this comes from S. Singh and um, he or she, I'm not quite sure, um, asks, and this is great too, because I think um, a lot of people deal with this. So looking at the camera during interviews <laughs> causes me anxiety and I forget what I want to say or have prepared for. Any tips you can give to overcome this fear anxiety? I am generally an introvert. Yes. So now we get into like, how does an introvert cope with, so not just respecting that we're inter introverts and extroverts on this thing trying to talk, but how do you cope with, with that? So one, I'm going to go back to a tip that I did give in, you know, in my little spiel, and that is to kind of practice and rehearse. So with yourself, so turn on a blank Zoom and talk to the camera and record it so that you can see how you look and where your eyes need to go. Because you can look at the camera, but let's say you have a note on your screen. I can casually look down and look back up. Or if I want to see what Singh wrote, I can say, oh, he's in the Bay Area of California, right? So it's 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 not quite as extreme nonstop con like connection as it is with something like TV, but ultimately that's how you mimic the eye contact. So I think rehearsing and recording yourself and that playback, I mean, that's public speaking 101 right there. Record myself. See how many freaking ums I said and fix them. But um, so that's that. And then I would use your friends and family. Um, and so see, um, now I'm going to be really hyper aware of it so that you can practice having a conversation you're entirely comfortable having because it's just personal stuff, um, but practicing the actual skill of looking at the camera. Then once you become more comfortable with just the basic skill of the camera, you can bring in the interview stuff to put it together because I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that in person, real, real world interviews before zoom, were probably a little bit challenging in that nervousness and anxiety that a lot of introverts feel. And so now we've just thrown in another piece of the whole puzzle. So hone in your ability to kind of navigate that piece and then you can improve your interview skills too. Yeah. I think that's actually an awesome idea is to, practice it on your own, record it, see how you look. Um, and you can even do that with your iPhone too, right? It's just like yep. do the video, you know, do like a selfie kind of video and record that and see how that looks. Totally. Um, and it's funny because you and I were talking about introverts versus extroverts you right now. You totally inspired that piece. <laughs> I want to start thinking about it. I loved it. Yeah. And so I was, you know, I was saying to you how me as an extrovert, 
I'm missing that, you know, face to face, right? Physical connection right now. Um, but I do have some introvert qualities as well. So I will say that every time I'm gearing up for even like an up level live session, just like right before it, there's this little bit of part of me where like I feel that anxiety too. So as thinking out there, like I feel that too. I, I you know, yeah. I, and I think it's just, it's a different feeling from when you are walking into a physical interview face to face, you know, versus this, because, um, because yeah, you, it's just a slightly different experience that, you know, being on video versus, you know, in person. And, uh, but I will say this, I also do know some introverts that, um, love being behind yes. the camera. It's almost like a little bit of like a, a barrier like for them. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I completely um, agree. Yeah, so I think it's very interesting depending upon um, what attributes you have as either an introvert or an extrovert and how you're uh, how all of us are really na navigating this new world. So it's just been kind of fascinating for me to talk to some of my introvert friends and my extrovert friends to see how they're doing. Yeah, I totally agree. Let me move on to the next question. Okay. So this one comes in from Todd. He says, how can you respectfully connect with recruiters on LinkedIn at companies you would like to work at? I know they are probably being bombarded right now with a ton of applicants. So how can you stand out? All right, so number one there is have a realistic expectation of what the rate of return on the messages will be. Because even before they were bombarded, there was still it was still a small return on that time investment. However, the return you get is like is worth gold. So there is a lot of value there. I am going to say there's kind of a few things. One, make sure your profile, your LinkedIn profile is really optimized, complete um, and up to date and speaks to the brand that you want to put out there as a job seeker so that if you message a recruiter and they look at your profile, it connects and two and two equals four. Because if there's a disconnect, that's going to already ca cause a fall off in the return on the message because they just are, are a little bit confused. Two, keep your messages short and point short and pointed. There has to be an action item, but it has to be a little bit of like a soft ask. So I'll give you just a straight up example. I, I bet you get this too, Robin. I get tapped with a whole lot of lead generation services on LinkedIn and they will send me a message this long. And at the bottom is, hey, book some time on me with Calendly. And it is the most impersonal thing I've ever, ever seen, let alone I'm not going to read it, especially for somebody that gets right. dozens of messages a day and a week. So uh, short and sweet is going to at least get it read. And I think something that's very conversational with a soft ask, like, hey, Robin, I, I'm, um, I came across X company and I did some research. It seems like a really great fit with, for me. I would love some insight on where you think my skill set would fit. How do I craft an ap application strategy? But, like, you not, can you help me get into the process? Because I also see that, like, too forward. And I also see too much detail. So if, if you can't see it, on your on the pop up message screen, it's too long. Right. Um, so all of those will add up to a little incremental pieces, but it's still it's still a, 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 there's a level of uncertainty on the rate you're going to get. So my last suggestion there is any way you can work yourself into the recruiter without only having to go directly to the recruiter would be good. Think about going to somebody in the department for an informational interview. They may be more likely to reach out. Think about your network. Is there somebody who's a first or second connection from somebody else in the company that then you can get to the recruiter? So it isn't it doesn't always have to be a one step process. And sometimes adding steps to the process will actually <clears throat> get you there because the conversation becomes has a stronger tie to it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, I I was talking to someone the other day about this. Um, so they are a recruiter and um they were talking about just the fact of how people are reaching out to them um and so yeah they were just basically saying that you know they obviously want to help as many people as possible right 
you know, we are going through uh, a really challenging time, right, on various different levels for, for people. And so, um, and so it was like, I want to help everybody. But then it's like, depending upon how that person is communicating with me, and what they're saying, unfortunately, some people are going to stand out, you know, mm -hmm. above the rest and that you will naturally want to reach out, you know, and help them. Um, so I do like your, your suggestion, like, you know, keep it short and sweet, like whatever comes up, right? Like whatever fits in that window, you know, when the link message is like, and a lot of times I, re I don't even recommend, now if you're, a lot of times I don't even recommend attaching a resume. Like, can you talk to me first before I try to sell myself to you? Because right. I think what a lot of people miss in networking, especially when it's associated with job searching, is the fact that networking equals relationship building. It's not a fast track solution. And you have to craft your messaging and craft your strategy and tactics to that fact. Um, yeah. You know, otherwise, you know, the giant, oh, my gosh, here's a brain dump of why you need to talk to me is going to is going to be a little bit of a turnoff. Definitely. Also, um, and so I'm going to ask this question um, before I jump back into audience questions. There has been some um, um, strategy out there where people are saying, okay, don't submit your resume or like an application to like 200 different jobs. You know, pick maybe 10 companies that you would really love to work at and um, find 10 people at each of those companies that you start to build that relationship with so that you become top of mind for them so that when, you know, positions open up that they think of you first. What do you think of that as a strategy right now? I, why not? I take the, I take the dual approach and, and ultimately I think it, well, let me start with, I think it depends on where you're at and how much and what luxury of time you have. Because obviously, if a role is open now, it will be filled faster than a role that isn't open yet or hasn't been created yet. So at some at some point, you have to kind of evaluate the strategy and how it fits your timeline and your in your financial situation to some extent. Um, I what I'm telling clients right now is almost equal effort. So there's validity to online job boards, but ultimately less than 30% of the jobs out there are filled through them. So that means we really, and this was before the pandemic. And so we really have to have a healthy dose of, I think, I think they're out there, they're a resource. We might as well leverage them. However, anywhere you can connect that to a human helps your chances. And then you've got the separate networking of trying to, networking effort of trying to create an opportunity or get ahead of an opportunity. So I fully yeah. support both. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me move on to another question from the audience. This comes in from Ruslan. Automated interviews, what is your opinion on this topic? <laughs> they are gaining popularity lately. It's very difficult to talk to a robot knowing no human is on the other side. It's like leaving a video message never could that you could never master. My face says it all. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you really want my honest, honest opinion, which I'm really good at, I, could we could we further dehumanize human resources here is how I feel about it. Um, and so I think there's multiple ways you could go about it. You could. I mean, do you want to work for a company who has that as part of their interview strategy? If you do, yeah. and you have to go have to go through the necessary evil. A lot of the same things we're talking about here apply eye contact. Um, projection, uh, preparing is probably a good thing. And because they're all, I've seen them where they're just real simple. I've seen them when they're five minutes long. I see them where they're 45 minute lo minutes long. I've seen them where they'll ask you a three part question in one question. And you're like, how am I supposed to answer that in a minute and a half? So you kind of have to be prepared for anything. <laughs> um, glass door sometimes will tell you some little insights and tidbits about company's interview process. You might be able to okay. dig up like a little bit of insider information, but ultimately I, you know what I've even told people before is to tape a picture of somebody on your screen. I mean, basically it's a lot like a phone interview because you're, you know how you, when you're talking to somebody, okay, you can get the auditory uh, affirmation, but you're not getting the visual nods of the head. So you, yeah. you kind of just have to pretend that there is, that there is that activity and that reaction on the other end. And basically here you have to pretend the same thing. 
whether it's physically putting a picture on there or, I mean, you guys, when Robin wasn't on here and I was just doing my slides, I can't see anybody. So I'm just going about this acting like you guys are like, yeah, Angie's great. And for all I know, you're all clicking mute because I'm like doing this too much. So at some point you just have to like chalk it up to a performance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, here's another question. This comes in from Nicole. She says, I get lots of first, second, and even third interviews, but no job. I hear that some passed over candidates ask the company for feedback. How exactly would I go about doing that? Which person would I talk to? What words would I use? Okay. I'm actually going to give you, I'm going to answer the question, then I'm going to answer the question that's not there, but should be. So the question that's not there that should be is, why are you always the bridesmaid and never the bride? And not to be harsh, but that's got to, has something to do with what you are or aren't doing in an interview. Um, as far as how to get feedback, good luck. <laughs> it's really, really hard to get. You can, you can thank living in the most litigious society in the world for that. Um, but usually your best shot is to go back to whoever your main point of contact was, whether that was like the recruiter or the HR person who was kind of brokering and facilitating the whole scheduling, or whether you were in communications with somebody like in the department or the hiring manager. And just the simple question of, you know, I, I would really love some just feedback on why, you know, on, 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 and maybe not why you didn't select me, but I would really love some feedback on um, how you interpreted my interview so that I can improve them for my next opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very hesitant to give it. When you get it, it's really, it's actually usually really valuable. Yeah. Um, but, and this is not like a sales thing, that's where somebody who interview coaches can tell you what you are or are not doing that is causing that situation. Yeah. Yeah, and if I could add to that, um, I've had, you know, a lot of experience um, in terms of what that job process looks like and the second and third interview and, you know, not getting a job. Um, sometimes, you know, and it is really frustrating, especially because, you know, like if you're going in for a second time, and especially a third time and you don't get the job, I would say that unfortunately a lot of companies today are doing several interviews because you have to meet with key people, yes. right? In order for those key people to really gather uh, a feedback of that candidate, right? And, and, consensus and hiring, it's yes. total consensus hiring now, instead of hiring manager saying, I like her, the whole team's got to have the buy-in. Yes, exactly. And so I will say that, um, it's definitely frustrating, but just know that if you did receive that third interview, you are a very narrow pool of candidates, which is great. And I think that you can absolutely ask for feedback then because yeah. they really had you high on your list. And, you know, and, and like you said, when I've asked for feedback, I've always received feedback. People have really? been, yeah, been really I, I, open. It's like, I feel like it's like less than 50%. But at that point, if you're that far in the process, I do think your, I do think your, your response rate will go up on that. Yes, and ultimately exactly. I feel like, you know, the harsh answer of there's something like there's a common denominator there and it's you. However, to be a little, you know, to take it back one step, that common denominator may have three or four factors at play that all add up to no success. Like maybe they actually did hire somebody who was more experienced in one of those jobs. Um, and maybe there wasn't a fit for the team, but then you have to ask yourself if you would have been a fit. So there's there's like a lot of different reasons that can add up to that continued lack of success, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean it's any less frustrating. And ultimately, I do think there are things that candidates can do to kind of circumnavigate that. A yeah. lot of time, a lot of times it has to do with being able to close the interview. Yep. Yeah. And if if I I'm gonna add uh, one other thing too is and I've experienced this where they chose someone else. So you did interview number three. They chose someone else. And then actually 
that person doesn't work out for various different reasons. And then if you are second on that list, you will get a call. And so I think that, you know, in that case, just keep a really good relationship with the people that you've interviewed, um, because they will have you right there on the top of their mind for whatever reason. That's actually happened a couple of times where things didn't pan out. And I got a call. Yeah. So, or if, um, the so first, if the first choice for some reason reneges the acceptance because they get another offer, or yeah, don't definitely don't burn the bridge. Definitely never burn a bridge. Um, any other things that maybe we can touch upon? Actually, you know what? Sorry, another question just came. I, saying, I, just, saw number, I just saw another. That like, number let's one. see <laughs> who it is. Okay, this comes from Casey. So. What does closing the interview tend <laughs> to look like? And that's, that's good. That's actually really good. Because I would say that probably nine times out of 10, it's like, well, what questions do you have for, for, for us? You know, but maybe that changed around. Maybe they say, what questions do you have for us at the beginning? And then how do you close up that interview? So that's a great question. I'm going to, I'm going to give you guys, I mean, this is like, I rarely give the following information outside of a paid client session. So. <laughs> Most of the time at the end of an interview, they'll say, okay, what questions do you have for us? And you'll go, okay, I have this question. I have this question. What's your timeline? Okay. Okay. Do you have any more questions? No, I think that's it. Okay. And it's awkward. It's an awkward end to the interview. Whereas if you flip that on its head and you say to them, well, my last question is, I want to know why you wouldn't hire me. Now that's, that's like, (laughs) don't say that, but ultimately that's your selling closing question. I want to know what reservations you have about my ability to fill this role. Now, what you've done is give them an opportunity to tell you anything that they're thinking that they haven't, clarify something that was misconstrued in the interview. You get to reinforce anything that um, they may be, they may have misconstrued or misunderstood. And the big thing is now it's up to them to stop answer, stop asking questions. And so yeah. they have to say, you know, Casey, we don't have any problems. Thank you so much. Or yeah. you know, our only concern is that you have three years less experience than we ideally were looking for. Well, as I said earlier, this is the, why that doesn't matter. Okay, well, thank you so much. We'll be in touch. They have yeah. to interview, and you've had the opportunity to lay everything out on the table, and you can walk out of that room knowing you did everything you possibly can. That's yeah. closing the interview. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, anything else that we want to touch upon? Because, you know, again, I mean, everything is virtual right now, and people are definitely feeling. Uh, uh, you know, from Teague, especially if they have a day full full of of Zoom meetings. Um, Any other thing that you want to touch upon before we close out in terms of virtual communications? That's open-ended, Robin. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I get a lot of questions about like applicant tracking systems. Because that's, I mean, that's part of like your virtual, I mean, your resume is your virtual communication. So, you know what, I know what I'm I'm actually going to combine a little bit of personal, of personal professional branding with a little bit of virtual communications and summarize it all. Everything you put out there from your LinkedIn profile to your resume, to your cover letter, to emails needs to speak the same language and be representative of who you are as a person and a professional. What you don't want to do is set yourself up for a situation where they think somebody else is walking into the Zoom room in an interview or that is going to show up or they get confused about, I don't get this resume in conjunction with um, with what's online. So I think the very, very baseline of successful and effective virtual communications is making sure it is all aligned across all platforms and all types. That's great. Great way to close out because I think that sometimes people don't uh, pay a lot of attention to that. Like for example, um, you know, between LinkedIn, the resume and the cover letter, that kind of is all very succinct, but they don't realize that if you're on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, whatever, that you really want to make sure that there is some consistency in terms of, you know, how you're presenting yourself, like what information you're putting out there, all of that, whether it is LinkedIn or Instagram. So that's a great way to close out. Yep. So before we totally close out today's Enjoy. session, we have to announce a winner for the group session. So I am going to just kind of do a drum roll in terms of everybody that is here and pull out a name. So yeah, so drum roll. 
<laughs> I am going to choose Casey from Denver. So Casey Ford, if you're still with us, can you just go in the chat and say, hey, I'm here. Um, if you Casey, not, we'll talk about it on that call that's already on the calendar later. This <laughs> well, and then let's, yeah, it's okay. So Casey yeah. is here. Um, that's great. So uh, Casey, what I am going to do is I'm going to add my email to the chat. and I'm you, adding my LinkedIn address to the chat for you guys. Okay, so, perfect. Yeah, yeah, do that too. Yeah, so everyone, please connect with um, Angie on LinkedIn. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn as well. Um, and also feel free to follow us on Crowdcast because in that way, every single week, you're going to get an alert and notification for when our next um, Up Level Live session is. Again, they are every Wednesday. And they do tend to fluctuate between um, 10 a.m., 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Eastern Time or uh, 12 p.m., 3 p.m. Pacific, again, Eastern Time. Um, so, but if you follow us on Crowdcast, you'll get an alert so you know when it's coming up. Um, and for me on LinkedIn, I'm Robin N. Cohen on LinkedIn, I believe. Um, so you can find me that way. Um, Casey, my email is there. Please feel free to email me so we can get all of your details together so that I can shoot that over to Angie. Um, Angie, this is great. I Thank think you, Robin. really important uh, topic of conversation. Um, so I was really happy to have you here and to touch upon all that stuff. Thanks to everyone for joining us today for today's Up Level Live session on how to effectively communicate virtually. And um, we will see you next week. And Angie, I will talk to you soon. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Robin. Bye.